Chapter Seventeen of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter Seventeen, in which the story pauses a little. This rector of Broxton is little better than a pagan, I hear one of my readers exclaim. How much more edifying it would have been if you had made him give Arthur some truly spiritual advice. You might have put into his mouth the most beautiful things, quite as good as reading a sermon. Certainly I could, if I held it the highest vocation of the novelist to represent things as they never have been and never will be. Then, of course, I might refashion life and character entirely after my own liking. I might select the most unexceptionable type of clergyman, and put my own admirable opinions into his mouth on all occasions. But it happens, on the contrary, that my strongest effort is to avoid any such arbitrary picture, and to give a faithful account of men and things as they have mirrored themselves in my mind. The mirror is doubtless defective, the outlines will sometimes be disturbed, the reflection faint or confused, but I feel as much bound to tell you as precisely as I can what that reflection is, as if I were in the witness-box, narrating my experience on oath. Sixty years ago, it is a long time, so no wonder things have changed, all clergymen were not zealous. Indeed, there is reason to believe that the number of zealous clergymen was small, and it is probable that if one among the small minority had owned the livings of Broxton and Hayslope in the year 1799, you would have liked him no better than you like Mr. Irwin. Ten to one you would have thought him a tasteless, indiscreet, methodistical man. It is so very rarely that facts hit that nice medium required by our own enlightened opinions and refined taste. Perhaps you will say, do improve the facts a little, then. Make them more accordant with those correct views which it is our privilege to possess. The world is not just what we like. Do touch it up with a tasteful pencil, and make believe it is not quite such a mixed and tangled affair. Let all people who hold unexceptionable opinions act unexceptionably. Let your most faulty characters always be on the wrong side, and your virtuous ones on the right. Then we shall see at a glance whom we are to condemn and whom we are to approve. Then we shall be able to admire, without the slightest disturbance of our prepossessions. We shall hate and despise with that true ruminant relish which belongs to undoubting confidence. But, my good friend, what will you do then with your fellow parishioner who opposes your husband in the vestry? with your newly appointed vicar, whose style of preaching you find painfully below that of his regretted predecessor, with the honest servant who worries your soul with her one failing, with your neighbor, Mrs. Green, who was really kind to you in your last illness, but has said several ill-natured things about you since your convalescence, nay, with your excellent husband himself, who has other irritating habits beside that of not wiping his shoes. These fellow mortals, every one, must be accepted as they are, you can neither straighten their noses, nor brighten their wit, nor rectify their dispositions, and it is these people, amongst whom your life is passed, that it is needful you should tolerate, pity, and love. It is these more or less ugly, stupid, inconsistent people whose movements of goodness you should be able to admire, for whom you should cherish all possible hopes, all possible patience. And I would not, even if I had the choice, be the clever novelist who could create a world so much better than this in which we get up in the morning to do our daily work, that you would be likely to turn a harder, colder eye on the dusty streets and the common green fields, on the real breathing men and women, who can be chilled by your indifference or injured by your prejudice, who can be cheered and helped onward by your fellow-feeling, your forbearance, your outspoken, brave justice. So I am content to tell my simple story, without trying to make things seem better than they were, dreading nothing indeed but falsity, which, in spite of one's best efforts, there is reason to dread. Falsehood is so easy, truth so difficult. The pencil is conscious of a delightful facility in drawing a griffin. The longer the claws, and the larger the wings, the better. But that marvellous facility which we mistook for genius is apt to forsake us when we want to draw a real, unexaggerated lion. Examine your words well, and you will find that even when you have no motive to be false, it is a hard thing to say the exact truth even about your own immediate feelings, much harder than to say something fine about them which is not the exact truth. It is for this rare, precious quality of truthfulness that I delight in many Dutch paintings, which lofty-minded people despise. 
I find a source of delicious sympathy in these faithful pictures of a monotonous homely existence, which has been the fate of so many more among my fellow mortals than a life of pomp or of absolute indigence, of tragic suffering or of world-stirring actions. I turn without shrinking from cloud-born angels, from prophets, sibyls, and heroic warriors, to an old woman bending over her flower-pot, or eating her solitary dinner, while the noonday light, softened perhaps by a screen of leaves, falls on her mob-cap, and just touches the rim of her spinning-wheel, and her stone-jug, and all those cheap common things which are the precious necessaries of life to her. Or I turn to that village wedding, kept between four brown walls, where an awkward bridegroom opens the dance with a high-shouldered, broad-faced bride, while elderly and middle-aged friends look on, with very irregular noses and lips, and probably with quart-pots in their hands, but with an expression of unmistakable contentment and good-will. Foe, says my idealistic friend, what vulgar details! What good is there in taking all these pains to give an exact likeness of old women and clowns? What a low phase of life! What clumsy, ugly people! But, bless us, things may be lovable that are not altogether handsome, I hope. I am not at all sure that the majority of the human race have not been ugly, and even among those lords of their kind, the British, squat figures, ill-shapen nostrils, and dingy complexions, are not startling exceptions. Yet there is a great deal of family love amongst us. I have a friend or two whose class of features is such that the Apollo curl on the summit of their brows would be decidedly trying, yet to my certain knowledge tender hearts have beaten for them, and their miniatures, flattering but still not lovely, are kissed in secret by motherly lips. I have seen many an excellent matron, who could have never in her best days have been handsome, and yet she had a packet of yellow love letters in a private drawer and sweet children showered kisses on her sallow cheeks. And I believe there have been plenty of young heroes, of middle stature and feeble beards, who have felt quite sure they could never love anything more insignificant than a Diana, and yet have found themselves in middle life happily settled with a wife who waddles. Yes, thank God, human feeling is like the mighty rivers that bless the earth. It does not wait for beauty. It flows with resistless force and brings beauty with it. All honor and reverence to the divine beauty of form. Let us cultivate it to the utmost in men, women, and children, in our gardens and in our houses. But let us love that other beauty, too, which lies in no secret of proportion, but in the secret of deep human sympathy. Paint us an angel, if you can, with a floating violet robe and a face paled by the celestial light. Paint us yet oftener a Madonna, turning her mild face upward and opening her arms to welcome the divine glory. But do not impose on us any aesthetic rules which shall banish from the region of art those old women scraping carrots with their work-worn hands, those heavy clowns taking holiday in a dingy pothouse, those rounded backs and stupid weather-beaten faces that have bent over the spade and done the rough work of the world, those homes with their tin pans, their brown pitchers, their rough curs, and their clusters of onions. In this world there are so many of these common coarse people who have no picturesque sentimental wretchedness. It is so needful we should remember their existence, else we may happen to leave them quite out of our religion and philosophy and frame lofty theories which only fit a world of extremes. Therefore, let art always remind us of them. Therefore, let us always have men ready to give the loving pains of a life to the faithful representing of commonplace things, men who see beauty in these commonplace things and delight in showing how kindly the light of heaven falls on them. There are few prophets in the world, few sublimely beautiful women, few heroes. I can't afford to give all my love and reverence to such rarities. I want a great deal of those feelings for my everyday fellow-men, especially for the few in the foreground of the great multitude, whose faces I know, whose hands I touch, for whom I have to make way with kindly courtesy. Neither are picturesque lazzaroni or romantic criminals half so frequent as your common laborer, who gets his own bread and eats it vulgarly, but creditably, with his own pocket-knife. It is more needful that I should have a fibre of sympathy connecting me with that vulgar citizen who weighs out my sugar in a vilely assorted cravat and waistcoat, than with the handsomest rascal in red scarf and green feathers. More needful that my heart should swell with loving admiration at some trait of gentle goodness in the faulty people who sit at the same hearth with me, or in the clergyman of my own parish, who is perhaps rather too corpulent, and in other respects is not an Oberlin or a Tillotson, than at the deeds of heroes whom I shall never know except by hearsay, or at the sublimest abstract of all clerical graces that was ever conceived by an able novelist. 
and so I come back to Mr. Irwin, with whom I desire you to be in perfect charity, far as he may be from satisfying your demands on the clerical character. Perhaps you think he was not, as he ought to have been, a living demonstration of the benefits attached to a national church. But I am not sure of that, at least I know that the people in Broxton and Hayslip would have been very sorry to part with their clergyman, and that most faces brightened at his approach, and until it can be proved that hatred is a better thing for the soul than love, I must believe that Mr. Irwin's influence in his parish was a more wholesome one than that of the zealous Mr. Ride, who came here twenty years afterwards when Mr. Irwin had been gathered to his father's. It is true Mr. Ride insisted strongly on the doctrines of the Reformation, visited his flock a great deal in their own homes, and was severe in rebuking the aberrations of the flesh, put a stop, indeed, to the Christmas rounds of the church singers, as promoting drunkenness and too light a handling of sacred things. But I gathered from Adam Bede, to whom I talked of these matters in his old age, that few clergymen could be less successful in winning the hearts of their parishioners than Mr. Ride. They learned a great many notions about doctrine from him, so that almost every church-goer under fifty began to distinguish as well between the genuine gospel and what did not come precisely up to that standard, as if he had been born and bred a dissenter, and for some time after his arrival there seemed to be quite a religious movement in that quiet rural district. But, said Adam, I've seen pretty clear ever since I was a young un as religion's something else besides notions. It isn't notions that's people doing the right thing, it's feelings. It's the same with the notions in religion as it is with mathematics. A man may be able to work problems straight off in his head as he sits by the fire and smokes his pipe, but if he has to make a machine or a building, he must have a will and a resolution and love something else better than his own ease. Somehow the congregation began to fall off, and people began to speak lighter, Mr. Ride. I believe he meant right at bottom, but you see, he was sourish-tempered, and was for beating down prices with the people as worked for him, and his preaching wouldn't go down well with that sauce, and he wanted to be like my lord judge of the parish, punishing folks for doing wrong, and he scolded him for the pulpit as if he'd been a ranter, and yet he couldn't abide the dissenters, and was a deal more set against him than Mr. Irwin was, and then he didn't keep within his income, for he seemed to think at first go off that six hundred a year was to make him as big a man as Mr. Donathorne. That's a sore mischief I've often seen with the poor curates jumping into a bit of living all of a sudden. Mr. Ride was a deal thought on at a distance, I believe, and he wrote books, but as for mathematics and the nature of things, he was as ignorant as a woman. He was very knowing about doctrines, and used to call them the bulwarks of the Reformation, but I've always mistrusted that sort of learning as leaves folks foolish and unreasonable about business. Now Mr. Irwin was as different as could be, as quick. He understood what you meant in a minute, and he knew all about building, and could see when you'd made a good job. And he behaved as much like a gentleman to the farmers, and the old women, and the laborers, as he did to the gentry. You never saw him interfering and scolding and trying to play the emperor. Ah, he was a fine man as ever you set eyes on, and so kind to his mother and sisters. That poor sickly Miss Anne. He seemed to think more of her than of anybody else in the world. There wasn't a soul in the parish had a word to say against him, and his servants stayed with him till they were so old and pottering he had to hire other folks to do their work. Well, I said, that was an excellent way of preaching in the weekdays. But I dare say, if your old friend Mr. Irwin were to come to life again and get into the pulpit next Sunday, you wouldn't be rather ashamed that he didn't preach better after all your praise of him. "'Nay, nay,' said Adam, broadening his chest and throwing himself back in his chair, as if he were ready to meet all inferences. "'Nobody has ever heard me say Mr. Irwin was much of a preacher. He didn't go into deep spiritual experience, and I know there's a deal in a man's inward life as you can't measure by the square and say, "'Do this, and that'll follow, and do that, and this'll follow. There's things go on in the soul, and times when feelings come into you like a rushing mighty wind, as the scripture says, and part your life in two almost.' so you look back on yourself as if you were somebody else. Those are things as you can't bottle up in a do this and do that, and I'll go so far with the strongest Methodist ever you'll find. That shows me there's deep spiritual things in religion. You can't make much out with talking about it, but you feel it. Mr. Irwin didn't go into those things. He preached short, moral sermons, and that was all. But then he acted pretty much up to what he said. He didn't set up for being so different from other folks one day, and then be as like him as two peas the next. And he made folks love him and respect him, and that was better nor stirring up their gall with being over-busy. 
Mrs. Poyser used to say, you know, she would have her word about everything. She said, Mr. Irwin was like a good meal of victual. You were the better for him without thinking on it. And Mr. Ride was like a dose of physic. He gripped you and worded you, and after all he left you much the same. But didn't Mr. Ride preach a great deal more about the spiritual part of religion that you talk of, Adam? Couldn't you get more out of his sermons than out of Mr. Irwin's? Eh, I know no. He preached a deal about doctrines, but I've seen pretty clear ever since I was a young un as religion's something else besides doctrines and notions. I look at it as if the doctrines was like finding names for your feelings, so as you can talk of em when you've never known em, just as a man may talk tools when he knows their names, though he's never so much as seen em, still less handle em. I've heard a deal of doctrine in my time, for I used to go after the dissenting preachers along with Seth, when I was a lad of seventeen, and got puzzling myself a deal about the Arminians and the Calvinists. The Wesleyans, you know, are strong Arminians, and Seth, who could never abide anything harsh and was always for hope in the best, held fast by the Wesleyans from the very first. But I thought I could pick a hole or two in their notions, and I got disputing with one of the class leaders down at Treddleson, and harassed him so. First to this side, then to that, till at last he said, "'Young man, it's the devil making use of your pride and conceit as a weapon to war against the simplicity of truth.' I couldn't help laughing then, but as I was going home, I thought the man wasn't far wrong. I began to see as all this weighing and sifting, what this text means and that text means, and whether folks are saved all by God's grace, or whether there goes an ounce of their own will to it, was no part of real religion at all. You may talk of these things for hours on end, and you'll only be all the more coxy and conceited for it. So I took to going nowhere but to church, and hearing nobody but Mr. Irwin, for he said nothing but what was good and what should be the wiser for remembering, and I found it better for my soul to be humble before the mysteries of God's dealings, and not be making a clatter about what I could never understand. And they're poor foolish questions, after all, for what have we got either inside or outside of us but what comes from God? If we got a resolution to do right, he gave it us, I reckon, first or last, but I see plain enough we shall never do it without a resolution, and that's enough for me." Adam, you perceive, was a warm admirer, perhaps a partial judge, of Mr. Irwin, as happily some of us still are of the people we have known familiarly. Doubtless it will be despised as a weakness by that lofty order of minds who pant after the ideal, and are oppressed by a general sense that their emotions are of too exquisite a character to find fit objects among their everyday fellowmen. I have often been favoured with the confidence of these select natures, and find them to concur in the experience that great men are overestimated and small men are insupportable, that if you would love a woman without ever looking back on your love as a folly, she must die when you are courting her, and if you would maintain the slightest belief in human heroism, you must never make a pilgrimage to see the hero. I confess I have often meanly shrunk from confessing to these accomplished and acute gentlemen what my own experience has been. I am afraid I have often smiled with hypocritical assent, and gratified them with an epigram on the fleeting nature of our illusions, which any one moderately acquainted with French literature can command at a moment's notice. Human converse, I think some wise man has remarked, is not rigidly sincere. But I herewith discharge my conscience, and declare that I have had quite enthusiastic movements of admiration towards old gentlemen who spoke the worst English, who were occasionally fretful in their temper, and who had never moved in a higher sphere of influence than that of parish overseer, and that the way in which I have come to the conclusion that human nature is lovable, the way I have learned something of its deep pathos, its sublime mysteries, has been by living a great deal among people more or less commonplace and vulgar, of whom you would perhaps hear nothing very surprising if you were to inquire about them in the neighborhoods where they dwelt. Ten to one most of the small shopkeepers in their vicinity saw nothing at all in them, for I have observed this remarkable coincidence, that the select natures who pant after the ideal, and find nothing in pantaloons or petticoats great enough to command the reverence and love, are curiously in unison with the narrowest and pettiest. For example, I have often heard Mr. Gedge, the landlord of the Royal Oak, who used to turn a bloodshot eye on his neighbours in the village of Shepperton, sum up his opinion of the people in his own parish, and they were all the people he knew, in these emphatic words— Ay, sir, I've said it often, and I'll say it again. They're a poor lot in this parish. A poor lot, sir, big and little. I think he had a dim idea that if he could migrate to a distant parish, he might find neighbors worthy of him, and indeed he did subsequently transfer himself to the Saracen's Head, 
which was doing a thriving business in the back street of a neighboring market town. But oddly enough, he has found the people up that back street of precisely the same stamp as the inhabitants of Shepperton. A poor lot, sir, big and little. And them as comes for a go o' gin are no better than them as comes for a pint o' twopenny. A poor lot. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter Eighteen. Church. Hetty! Hetty! Don't you know church begins at two, and it's gone half after one already? Have you got nothing better to think on this good Sunday, as poor old Thias leaves to be put into the ground, and him drowned at the dead of the night? As it's enough to make one's back run cold. But you must be dizin' in yourself as if there was a wedding instead of a funeral. Well, aunt, said Hetty, I can't be ready so soon as everybody else when I've got Totty's things to put on, and I'd ever such work to make her stand still. Hetty was coming downstairs, and Mrs. Poyser, in her plain bonnet and shawl, was standing below. If ever a girl looked as if she had been made of roses, that girl was Hetty, in her Sunday hat and frock. For her hat was trimmed with pink, and her frock had pink spots, sprinkled on a white ground. There was nothing but pink and white about her, except in her dark hair and eyes, and her little buckled shoes. Mrs. Poyser was provoked at herself, for she could hardly keep from smiling, as any mortal is inclined to do at the sight of pretty round things. So she turned without speaking and joined the group outside the house door, followed by Hetty, whose heart was fluttering so at the thought of someone she expected to see at church that she hardly felt the ground she trod on. And now the little procession set off. Mr. Poyser was in his Sunday suit of drab, with a red and green waistcoat and a green watch ribbon having a large cornelian seal attached, pendant like a plumb line from that promontory where his watch pocket was situated, a silk handkerchief of a yellow tone round his neck, and excellent grey ribbed stockings, knitted by Mrs. Poyser's own hand, setting off the proportions of his leg. Mr. Poyser had no reason to be ashamed of his leg, and suspected that the growing abuse of top boots and other fashions tending to disguise the nether limbs had their origin in a pitiable degeneracy of the human calf. Still less had he reason to be ashamed of his round, jolly face, which was good-humour itself, as he said, "'Come, Hetty, come, little uns,' and giving his arm to his wife, led the way through the causeway gate into the yard. The little uns addressed were Marty and Tommy, boys of nine and seven, in little fustian-tailed coats and knee-breeches, relieved by rosy cheeks and black eyes, looking as much like their father as a very small elephant is like a very large one. Hetty walked between them, and behind came patient Molly, whose task it was to carry Toddy through the yard and over all the wet places on the road, for Toddy, having speedily recovered from her threatened fever, had insisted on going to church to-day, and especially on wearing her red and black necklace outside her tippet and there were many wet places for her to be carried over this afternoon, for there had been heavy showers in the morning, though now the clouds had rolled off and lay in towering silvery masses on the horizon. You might have known it was Sunday if you had only waked up in the farmyard. The cocks and hens seemed to know it, and made only crooning, subdued noises. The very bulldog looked less savage, as if he would have been satisfied with a smaller bite than usual. The sunshine seemed to call all things to rest and not to labor. It was asleep itself, on the moss-grown cowshed, on the group of white ducks nestling together with their bills tucked under their wings, on the old black sow, stretched languidly on the straw, while her largest young one found an excellent spring-bed on his mother's fat ribs, on Alec the shepherd, in his new smock-frock, taking an uneasy siesta, half-sitting, half-standing, on the granary steps. Alec was of the opinion that church, like other luxuries, was not to be indulged in often by a foreman who had the weather and the ewes on his mind. Church? Nay, I'm gotten summat else to think on. 
was an answer which he often uttered in a tone of bitter significance that silenced further question. I feel sure Alec meant no irreverence. Indeed, I know that his mind was not of a speculative negative cast, and he would on no account have missed going to church on Christmas Day, Easter Day, and Whissantide. But he had a general impression that public worship and religious ceremonies, like other non-productive employments, were intended for people who had leisure. "'There's father a-standin' at the yard-gate,' said Martin Poyser. "'I reckon he wants to watch us down the field. "'It's wonderful what sight he has, and him turns seventy-five. "'Ah, I often think it's with the old folks as it is with the babies,' said Mrs. Poyser. "'They're satisfied with lookin', no matter what they're lookin' at. "'It's God Almighty's way of quietening them, I reckon, afore they go to sleep.' Old Martin opened the gate as he saw the family procession approaching, and held it wide open, leaning on his stick pleased to do this bit of work, for like all old men whose life has been spent in labour, he liked to feel that he was still useful, that there was a better crop of onions in the garden because he was by at the sowing, and that the cows would be milked the better if he stayed at home on a Sunday afternoon to look on. He always went to church on sacrament Sundays, but not very regularly at other times. On wet Sundays, or whenever he had a touch of rheumatism, he used to read the three first chapters of Genesis instead. "'They'll ha' put in thigh speed o' the ground afore ye get to the churchyard,' he said, as his son came up. "'It'd ha' been better luck if they'd ha' buried him in the forenoon when the rain was falling. "'There's no likelihoods of a drop now, and the moon lies like a boat there, dost see? "'That's a sure sign of fair weather. There's a many as is false, but that's sure.' "'Aye, aye,' said the son. "'I'm in hopes it'll hold up now. "'Mind what the parson says, mind what the parson says, my lads,' said grandfather to the black-eyed youngsters in knee-breeches conscious of a marble or two in their pockets which they looked forward to handling a little secretly during the sermon so by dan dad said toddy me doin de church me dot my necklace on Div me a peppermint grandad shaking with laughter at this deep little wench slowly transferred his stick to his left hand which held the gate open and slowly thrust his finger into the waistcoat pocket on which toddy had fixed her eyes with a confident look of expectation and when they were all gone, the old man leaned on the gate again, watching them across the lane, along the home close, and through the far gate, till they disappeared behind a bend in the hedge. For the hedgerows in those days shut out one's view, even on the better-managed farms, and this afternoon the dog-roses were tossing out their pink wreaths, the nightshade was in its yellow and purple glory, the pale honeysuckle grew out of reach, peeping high up out of a holly-bush, and over all an ash or a sycamore every now and then threw its shadow across the path. There were acquaintances at other gates who had to move aside and let them pass. At the gate of the home close there was half the dairy of cows standing one behind the other, extremely slow to understand that their large bodies might be in the way. At the far gate there was the mare holding her head over the bars, and beside her the liver-coloured foal with its head towards its mother's flank apparently still much embarrassed by its own straddling existence. The way lay entirely through Mr. Poyser's own fields, till they reached the main road leading to the village, and he turned a keen eye on the stock and the crops as they went along, while Mrs. Poyser was ready to supply a running commentary on them all. The woman who manages a dairy has a large share in making the rent, so she may well be allowed to have her opinion on stock and their keep an exercise which strengthens her understanding so much that she finds herself able to give her husband advice on most other subjects. "'There's that short-horned Sally,' she said, as they entered the home clothes, and she caught sight of the meek beast that lay chewing the cud and looking at her with a sleepy eye. "'I begin to hate the sight of the cow. And I say now what I said three weeks ago, the sooner we get rid of her the better, for there's that little yellow cow as doesn't give half the milk, and yet I've twice as much butter from her.' "'Why, thee'd not like the women in general,' said Mr. Poyser. They like the shorthorns as give such a lot of milk. There's Chown's wife wants him to buy no other sort. What's it signify what Chown's wife likes? A poor soft thing with no more headpiece nor a sparrow. She'd take a big cullender to strain her lard with, and then wonder as the scratchin's run through. I've seen enough of her to know as I'll never take a servant from her house again. All hugger mugger, and you'd never know when you went in whether it was Monday or Friday, the wash dragging on to the end of the week, and as for her cheese, I know well enough it rose like a loaf in the tin last year, and then she talks of the weather being in the fault, as there's folks that stand on their heads and then say the fault was of their boots. 
"'Well, Chown's been wantin' to buy Sally, so he can get rid of her if thee likest,' said Mr. Poyser, secretly proud of his wife's superior power of putting two and two together. Indeed, on recent market days he had more than once boasted of her discernment in this very matter of shorthorns. "'Ay, them as choose a soft for a wife may as well buy up the shorthorns, for if you get your head stuck in a bog, your legs may as well go after it.' "'Eh, talk o' legs, there's legs for you.' Mrs. Poyser continued, as Toddy, who had been set down now the road was dry, toddled all in front of her father and mother. They are shapes, and she's got such a long foot she'll be her father's own child. Ay, she'll be welly such a one as Hetty a ten years' time. Only she's got thy coloured eyes. I never remember a blue eye in my family. My mother had eyes as black as sloes, just like Hetty's. The child would be none the worse for having summat as isn't like Hetty. And I'm none for having her so over pretty. Though for the matter o' that, there's people with light hair and blue eyes as pretty as them with black. If Dinah had got a bit o' colour in her cheeks, and didn't stick that Methodist cap on her head enough to frighten the cows, folks would think her as pretty as Hetty. Nay, nay, said Mr. Poyser, with rather a contemptuous emphasis. They does na know the pints of a woman. The men had never run after Dinah as they would after Hetty. What care I what the men had run after? It's well seen what choice the most of em know how to make, by the poor draggle tails o' wives ye see, like bits o' gauze ribbon, good for nothing when the colour's gone. Well, well, they canst na say but what I knowed how to make a choice when I married thee, said Mr. Poyser, who usually settled little conjugal disputes by a compliment of this sort, and thee was twice as booksome as Dinah ten year ago. I never said as a woman had need to be ugly to make a good missus of a house. "'There's Chown's wife, ugly enough to turn the milk and save the rennet, "'but she'll never save nothing any other way. "'But as for Dinah, poor child, she's never likely to be booksome "'as long as she'll make her dinner a cake and water, "'for the sake of giving to them as want. "'She provoked me past bearing sometimes, "'and as I told her, she went clean again the scripture, "'for that says, love your neighbour as yourself. "'But, I said, if you loved your neighbour no better nor you do yourself, Dinah, "'it's little enough you'd do for him.' "'You'd be thinking he might do well enough on a half-empty stomach. Eh, "'I wonder where she is this blessed Sunday. "'Sitting by that sick woman, I dare say, "'as she'd set her heart on going to all of a sudden. "'Ah, it was a pity she should take such megrims into her head "'when she might have stayed with us all summer "'and eaten twice as much as she wanted, "'and it had never have been missed. "'She made no odds in the house at all, "'for she sat as still at her sewing as a bird on the nest "'and was uncommon nimble at running to fetch anything.' "'If Hetty gets married, thee'dst like to ha' Dinah with thee constant.' "'It's no use thinking o' that,' said Mrs. Poyser. "'You might as well beckon to the flying swallow as ask Dinah to come and live here comfortable, like other folks. "'If anything could turn her, I should ha' turned her, for I've talked to her for an hour on end. "'And scolded her, too, for she's my own sister's child, and it behoves me to do what I can for her. "'But, eh, poor thing, as soon as she'd said us good-bye and got into the cart, "'and looked back at me with her pale face, as is welly like her Aunt Judith come back from heaven, "'I begun to be frightened to think all the set-downs I'd given her, "'for it comes over you sometimes, as if she'd a way o' knowin' the rights o' things more nor other folks have. "'But I'll never give in as that's cause she's a Methodist, no more nor a white calf's white "'cause it eats out of the same bucket with a black un. "'Nay,' said Mr. Poyser, with as near an approach to a snarl as his good nature would allow, "'I'm no opinion of the Methodists. "'It's only tradesfolks as turn Methodists. "'You never knew a farmer bitten with them maggots. "'There's maybe a workman now and then, "'as is an over-clever at's work, "'takes to preaching in that, like Seth Bede. "'But you see Adam, "'as has got one of the best headpieces hereabout, "'knows better. "'He's a good churchman, "'else I'd never encourage him for a sweetheart for Hetty.' "'Why, goodness me,' said Mrs. Poyser, "'who had looked back while her husband was speaking. "'Look where Molly is with them lads.' "'They're the field's length behind us. "'How could you let him do so, Hetty? "'Anybody might as well set a picture to watch the children as you. "'Run back and tell him to come on.' "'Mr. and Mrs. Poyser were now at the end of the second field, "'so they set Toddy on top of one of the large stones "'forming the true Loamshire style, "'and awaited the loiterers Toddy observing with complacency. "'Day naughty, naughty boys. Me do it. "'The fact was that this Sunday walk through the fields "'was fraught with great excitement to Marty and Tommy who saw a perpetual drama going on in the hedgerows and could no more refrain from stopping and peeping than if they had been a couple of spaniels or terriers marty was quite sure he saw a yellow hammer on the boughs of that great ash 
and while he was peeping he missed the sight of a white-throated stoat, which had run across the path and was described with much fervour by the junior Tommy. Then there was a little greenfinch, just fledged, fluttering along the ground, and it seemed quite possible to catch it, till it managed to flutter under the blackberry bush. Hetty could not be got to give any heed to these things, so Molly was called on for her ready sympathy, and peeped with open mouth wherever she was told, and said, "'Locks!' whenever she was expected to wonder. Molly hastened on with some alarm when Hetty had come back and called to them that her aunt was angry, but Marty ran on first, shouting, "'We found the speckled turkey's nest, mother!' with the instinctive confidence that people who bring good news are never in fault. "'Ah!' said Mrs. Poyser, really forgetting all discipline in this pleasant surprise. "'That's a good lad. Why, where is it?' "'Down in ever such a hole under the hedge. I saw it first, looking after the greenfinch, and she sat on the nest.' "'You didn't frighten her, I hope,' said the mother, "'else she'll forsake it.' "'No, I went away as still as still, and whispered to Molly. Didn't I, Molly?' "'Well, well. Now come on,' said Mrs. Poyser, "'and walk before father and mother, and take your little sister by the hand. We must go straight on now. Good boys don't look after the birds of a Sunday.' "'But, mother,' said Marty, "'you said you'd give half a crown to find the speckled turkey's nest. Mayn't I have the half-crown put into my money-box?' "'We'll see about that, my lad, if you walk along now like a good boy.' The father and mother exchanged a significant glance of amusement at their eldest-born's acuteness, but on Tommy's round face there was a cloud. "'Mother,' he said, half crying, "'Marty's got ever so much more money in his box nor I've got in mine.' "'Money, me want a half a town in my box,' said Toddy. "'Hush, hush, hush,' said Mrs. Poyser. "'Did ever anybody hear such naughty children? Nobody shall ever see their money-boxes any more if they don't make haste and go on to church.' This dreadful threat had the desired effect, and through the two remaining fields the three pair of small legs trotted on without any serious interruption, notwithstanding a small pond full of tadpoles, alias bullheads, which the lads looked at wistfully. The damp hay that must be scattered and turned afresh to-morrow was not a cheering sight to Mr. Poyser, who during hay and corn harvest had often some mental struggles as to the benefits of a day of rest but no temptation would have induced him to carry on any field-work, however early in the morning, on a Sunday. For had not Michael Holdsworth had a pair of oxen sweltered while he was ploughing on Good Friday? That was a demonstration that work on sacred days was a wicked thing, and with wickedness of any sort Martin Poyser was quite clear that he would have nothing to do, since money got by such means would never prosper. "'It almost makes your fingers itch to be at the hay now the sun shines so,' he observed, as they passed through the big meadow but it's poor foolishness to think of saving by going against your conscience. There's that Jim Wakefield, as they used to call Gentleman Wakefield, used to do the same of a Sunday as weekdays, and took no heed to right or wrong, as if there was neither God nor devil. And what's he come to? Why, I saw him myself last market day a-carrying a basket with oranges in it. Ah, to be sure, said Mrs. Poyser, emphatically, you make but a poor trap to catch luck if you go and bait it with wickedness. The money as is got so is like to burn holes o' your pocket. I'd never wish us to leave our lads a sixpence, but what was got i' the rightful way. And as for the weather, there's one above makes it, and we must put up with it. It's nothing of a plague to what the wenches are. Notwithstanding the interruption in their walk, the excellent habit which Mrs. Poyser's clock had of taking time by the forelock had secured their arrival at the village while it was still a quarter to two, though almost every one who meant to go to church was already within the churchyard gates. Those who stayed at home were chiefly mothers, like Timothy's Bess, who stood at her own door nursing her baby and feeling as women feel in that position, that nothing else can be expected of them. It was not entirely to see Thias Bede's funeral that the people were standing about the churchyard so long before service began. That was their common practice. The women, indeed, usually entered the church at once, and the farmers' wives talked in an undertone to each other, over the tall pews, about their illnesses and the total failure of doctor's stuff, recommending dandelion tea and other homemade specifics as far preferable, about the servants, growing exorbitance as to wages, whereas the quality of their services declined from year to year, and there was no girl nowadays to be trusted any further than you could see her, about the bad price Mr. Dingall, the Treddleston grocer, was giving for butter, and the reasonable doubts that might be held as to his solvency, notwithstanding that Mrs. Dingall was a sensible woman, and they were all sorry for her, for she had very good kin. Meantime the men lingered outside, and hardly any of them except the singers, who had a humming and fragmentary rehearsal to go through, 
entered the church until Mr. Irwine was in the desk. They saw no reason for that premature entrance. What could they do in church if they were there before service began? And they did not conceive that any power in the universe could take it ill of them if they stayed out and talked a little about business. Chad Cranage looks like quite a new acquaintance today, for he has got his clean Sunday face, which always makes his little granddaughter cry at him as a stranger. But an experienced eye would have fixed on him at once as the village blacksmith, after seeing the humble deference with which the big saucy fellow took off his hat and stroked his hair to the farmers. For Chad was accustomed to say that a working man must hold a candle to a personage understood to be as black as he was himself on weekdays, by which evil-sounding rule of conduct he meant what was, after all, rather virtuous than otherwise, namely, that men who had horses to be shod must be treated with respect. Chad and the rougher sort of workmen kept aloof from the grave under the white thorn, where the burial was going forward. But Sandy Jim and several of the farm laborers made a group round it, and stood with their hats off, as fellow mourners with the mother and sons. Others held a midway position, sometimes watching the group at the grave, sometimes listening to the conversation of the farmers, who stood in a knot near the church door, and were now joined by Martin Poyser, while his family passed into the church. On the outside of this knot stood Mr. Casson, the landlord of the Donathorn Arms, in his most striking attitude, that is to say, with the forefinger of his right hand thrust between the buttons of his waistcoat, his left hand in his breeches pocket, and his head very much on one side, looking, on the whole, like an actor who has only a monosyllabic part entrusted to him, but feels sure that the audience discern his fitness for the leading business. Curiously in contrast with old Jonathan Burge, who held his hands behind him and leaned forward, coughing asthmatically with an inward scorn of all knowingness that could not be turned into cash. The talk was in rather a lower tone than usual to-day, hushed a little by the sound of Mr. Irwine's voice reading the final prayers of the burial service. They had all had their word of pity for poor Thias, but now they had got upon the nearer subject of their own grievances against Sashel, the squire's bailiff, who played the part of steward so far as it was not performed by old Mr. Donathorne himself. For that gentleman had the meanness to receive his own rents and make bargains about his own timber. This subject of conversation was an additional reason for not being loud, since Satchel himself might presently be walking up the paved road to the church door. And soon they became suddenly silent, for Mr. Irwine's voice had ceased, and the group round the white thorn was dispersing itself towards the church. They all moved aside and stood with their hats off while Mr. Irwine passed. Adam and Seth were coming next with their mother between them, for Joshua Rann officiated as head sexton as well as clerk, and was not yet ready to follow the rector into the vestry. But there was a pause before the three mourners came on. Lisbeth had turned round to look again towards the grave. Ah, there was nothing now but the brown earth under the white thorn. She cried less to-day than she had done any day since her husband's death. Along with all her grief there was mixed an unusual sense of her own importance, in having a burial, and in Mr. Irwine's reading a special service for her husband. And besides, she knew the funeral psalm was going to be sung for him. She felt this counter-excitement to her sorrow still more strongly as she walked with her sons towards the parish door, and saw the friendly sympathetic nods of their fellow parishioners. The mother and sons passed into the church, and one by one the loiterers followed, though some still lingered without. The sight of Mr. Donathorne's carriage, which was winding slowly up the hill, perhaps helping to make them feel that there was no need for haste. But presently the sound of the bassoon and the key bugles burst forth. The evening hymn, which always opened the service, had begun, and every one must now enter and take his place. I cannot say that the interior of Hayslope Church was remarkable for anything, except for the grey age of its oaken pews. Great square pews, mostly, ranged on each side of a narrow aisle. It was free, indeed, from the modern blemish of galleries. The choir had two narrow pews to themselves in the middle of the right-hand row, so that it was a short process for Joshua Rand to take his place among them as principal bass and return to his desk after the singing was over. The pulpit and desk, gray and old as the pews, stood on one side of the arch leading into the chancel, which also had its gray square pews for Mr. Donathorne's family and servants. Yet I assure you these gray pews, with the buff-washed walls, gave a very pleasing tone to this shabby interior, and agreed extremely well with the ruddy faces and bright waistcoats. And there were liberal touches of crimson toward the chancel, 
for the pulpit and Mr. Donnithorne's own pew had handsome crimson cloth cushions, and to close the vista there was a crimson altar cloth embroidered with golden rays by Miss Lydia's own hand. But even without the crimson cloth, the effect must have been warm and cheering when Mr. Irwine was in the desk, looking benignly round on that simple congregation, on the hardy old men with bent knees and shoulders, perhaps, but with vigor left for much hedge-clipping and thatching, on the tall, stalwart frames and roughly cut bronzed faces of the stone-cutters and carpenters, on the half-dozen well-to-do farmers with their apple-cheeked families, and on the clean old women, mostly farm laborers' wives, with their bit of snow-white cap border under their black bonnets, and with their withered arms bare from the elbow, folded passively over their chests. For none of the old people held books. Why should they? Not one of them could read. But they knew a few good words by heart, and their withered lips now and then moved silently, following the service, without any very clear comprehension indeed, but with a simple faith in its efficacy to ward off harm and bring blessing. And now all faces were visible, for all were standing up, the little children on the seats, peeping over the edge of the grey pews, while good Bishop Ken's evening hymn was being sung to one of those lively psalm tunes which died out with the last generation of rectors and choral parish clerks. Melodies die out, like the pipe of Pan, with the ears that love them and listen for them. Adam was not in his usual place among the singers to-day, for he sat with his mother and Seth, and he noticed with surprise that Bartle Massey was absent too, all the more agreeable for Mr. Joshua Rann, who gave out his bass notes with unusual complacency, and threw an extra ray of severity into the glances he sent over his spectacles at the recusant Will Maskery. I beseech you to imagine Mr. Irwine looking round on this scene, in his ample white surplice that became him so well, with his powdered hair thrown back, his rich brown complexion, and his finely cut nostril and upper lip. For there was a certain virtue in that benignant yet keen countenance, as there is in all human faces from which a generous soul beams out. And over all streamed the delicious June sunshine through the old windows, with their desultory patches of yellow, red, and blue, that threw pleasant touches of color on the opposite wall. I think, as Mr. Irwine looked round to-day, his eyes rested an instant longer than usual on the square pew occupied by Martin Poyser and his family. And there was another pair of dark eyes that found it impossible not to wander thither, and rest on that round pink and white figure. But Hetty was at that moment quite careless of any glances. She was absorbed in the thought that Arthur Donnithorne would soon be coming into church, for the carriage must surely be at the church gate by this time. She had never seen him since she parted with him in the wood on Thursday evening, and, oh, how long the time had seemed! Things had gone on just the same as ever since that evening. The wonders that had happened then had brought no changes after them. They were already like a dream. When she heard the church door swinging, her heart beat so she dared not look up. She felt that her aunt was curtsying. She curtsied herself. That must be old Mr. Donnithorne. He always came first. The wrinkled small old man peering round with short-sighted glances at the bowing and curtsying congregation. Then she knew Miss Lydia was passing, and though Hetty liked so much to look at her fashionable little coal-scuttle bonnet with the wreath of small roses round it, she didn't mind it to-day. But there were no more curtsies. No, he was not come. She felt sure there was nothing else passing the pew door but the housekeeper's black bonnet and the lady's maid's beautiful straw hat that had once been Miss Lydia's, and then the powdered heads of the butler and footman. No, he was not there. Yet she would look now, she might be mistaken, for after all she had not looked. So she lifted up her eyelids and glanced timidly at the cushioned pew in the chancel. There was no one but old Mr. Donnithorne rubbing his spectacles with his white handkerchief, and Miss Lydia opening the large gilt-edged prayer-book. The chill disappointment was too hard to bear. She felt herself turning pale, her lips trembling. She was ready to cry. Oh, what should she do? Everybody would know the reason. They would know she was crying because Arthur was not there. And Mr. Craig, with the wonderful hot house plant in his buttonhole, was staring at her, she knew. It was dreadfully long before the general confession began, so that she could kneel down. Two great drops would fall then, but no one saw them except good-natured Molly, for her aunt and uncle knelt with their backs towards her. Molly, unable to imagine any cause for tears in church except faintness, of which she had a vague traditional knowledge, 
drew out of her pocket a queer little flat blue smelling bottle, and after much labour in pulling the cork out, thrust the narrow neck under Hetty's nostrils. "'It don't smell,' she whispered, thinking this was a great advantage which old salts had over fresh ones. They did you good without biting your nose. Hetty pushed it away peevishly. But this little flash of temper did what the salts could not have done. It roused her to wipe away the traces of her tears, and try with all her might not to shed any more. Hetty had a certain strength in her vain little nature. She would have borne anything rather than be laughed at, or pointed at with any other feeling than admiration. She would have pressed her own nails into her tender flesh rather than people should know a secret she did not want them to know. What fluctuations there were in her busy thoughts and feelings while Mr. Irwine was pronouncing the solemn absolution in her deaf ears, and through all the tones of petition that followed. Anger lay very close to disappointment, and soon won the victory over the conjectures her small ingenuity could devise to account for Arthur's absence on the supposition that he really wanted to come, really wanted to see her again. And by the time she rose from her knees mechanically, because all the rest were rising, the colour had returned to her cheeks even with a heightened glow, for she was framing little indignant speeches to herself, saying she hated Arthur for giving her this pain, she would like him to suffer too. Yet while this selfish tumult was going on in her soul, her eyes were bent down on her prayer-book, and the eyelids with their dark fringe looked as lovely as ever. Adam Bede thought so, as he glanced at her for a moment on rising from his knees. But Adam's thoughts of Hetty did not deafen him to the service. They rather blended with all the other deep feelings for which the church service was a channel to him this afternoon, as a certain consciousness of our entire past and our imagined future blends itself with all our moments of keen sensibility. And to Adam the church service was the best channel he could have found for his mingled regret, yearning, and resignation. Its interchange of beseeching cries for help with outbursts of faith and praise, its recurrent responses and the familiar rhythm of its collects, seemed to speak for him as no other form of worship could have done. As to those early Christians who had worshipped from their childhood upwards in catacombs, the torchlight and shadows must have seemed nearer the divine presence than the heathenish daylight of the streets. The secret of our emotions never lies in the bare object, but in its subtle relations to our own past. No wonder the secret escapes the unsympathizing observer, who might as well put on his spectacles to discern odors. But there was one reason why even a chance-comer would have found the service in Hayslope Church more impressive than in most other village nooks in the kingdom, a reason of which I am sure you have not the slightest suspicion. It was the reading of our friend Joshua Rann. Where that good shoemaker got his notion of reading from remained a mystery even to his most intimate acquaintances. I believe, after all, he got it chiefly from nature, who had poured some of her music into this honest, conceited soul as she had been known to do into other narrow souls before his. She had given him, at least, a fine bass voice and a musical ear, but I cannot positively say what he's alone with the rich chant in which he delivered the responses. The way he rolled from a rich, deep forte into a melancholy cadence, subsiding at the end of the last word into a sort of faint resonance, like the lingering vibrations of a fine violoncello. I can compare to nothing for its strong, calm melancholy but the rush and cadence of the wind among the autumn boughs. This may seem a strange mode of speaking about the reading of a parish clerk, a man in rusty spectacles with stubbly hair, a large occiput, and a prominent crown. But that is nature's way. She will allow a gentleman of splendid physiognomy and poetic aspirations to sing woefully out of tune, and not give him the slightest hint of it and takes care that some narrow-browed fellow, trolling a ballad in the corner of a pot-house, shall be as true to his intervals as a bird. Joshua himself was less proud of his reading than of his singing, and it was always with a sense of heightened importance that he passed from the desk to the choir. Still more to-day, it was a special occasion, for an old man familiar to all the parish had died a sad death, not in his bed, a circumstance to the mind of the peasant, and now the funeral psalm was to be sung in memory of his sudden departure. Moreover, Barthy was not at church, and Joshua's importance in the choir suffered no eclipse. It was a solemn minor strain they sang. The old psalm tunes have many a wail among them, and the words, Thou sweep'st the sun 
to have a closer application than usual in the death of poor Thias. The mother and sons listened, each with peculiar feelings. Lisbeth had a vague belief that the psalm was doing her husband good. It was part of that decent burial which she would have thought it a greater wrong to withhold from him than to have caused him many unhappy days while he was living. The more there was said about her husband, the more there was done for him, surely the safer he would be. It was poor Lisbeth's blind way of feeling that human love and pity are a ground of faith in some other love. Seth, who was easily touched, shed tears, and tried to recall, as he had done continually since his father's death, all that he had heard of the possibility that a single moment of consciousness at the last might be a moment of pardon and reconcilement. For was it not written in the very psalm they were singing that the divine dealings were not measured and circumscribed by time? Adam had never been unable to join in a psalm before. He had known plenty of trouble and vexation since he had been a lad, but this was the first sorrow that had hemmed in his voice. And strangely enough, it was sorrow because the chief source of his past trouble and vexation was forever gone out of his reach. He had not been able to press his father's hand before their parting and say, Father, you know it was all right between us. I never forgot what I owed you when I was a lad. You forgive me if I have been too hot and hasty now and then. Adam thought but little to-day of the hard work and the earnings he had spent on his father. His thoughts ran constantly on what the old man's feelings had been in moments of humiliation, when he had held down his head before the rebukes of his son. When our indignation is borne in submissive silence, we are apt to feel twinges of doubt afterwards as to our own generosity, if not justice. How much more when the object of our anger has gone into everlasting silence, and we have seen his face for the last time in the meekness of death. Ah, I was always too hard, Adam said to himself. It's a sore fault in me as I'm so hot and out of patience with people when they do wrong, and my heart gets shut up against them, so as I can't bring myself to forgive them. I see clear enough there's more pride nor love in my soul, for I could sooner make a thousand strokes with the hammer for my father than bring myself to say a kind word to him and there went plenty of pride and temper to the strokes, as the devil will be having his finger in what we call our duties as well as our sins. Mayhap the best thing I ever did in my life was only doing what was easiest for myself. It's always been easier for me to work nor to sit still, but the real tough job for me would be to master my own will and temper, and go right against my own pride. It seems to me now, if I was to find father at home to-night, I should behave different. But there's no knowing. Perhaps nothing would be a lesson to us if it didn't come too late. It's well we should feel as life's a reckoning we can't make twice over. There's no real making amends in this world, any more nor you can mend a wrong subtraction by doing your addition right. This was the keynote to which Adam's thoughts had perpetually returned since his father's death, and the solemn wail of the funeral psalm was only an influence that brought back the old thoughts with stronger emphasis. So was the sermon, which Mr. Irwine had chosen with reference to Thias's funeral. It spoke briefly and simply of the words, in the midst of life we are in death. How the present moment is all we can call our own for works of mercy, of righteous dealing, and of family tenderness. All very old truths, but what we thought the oldest truth becomes the most startling to us in the week when we have looked on the dead face of one who has made a part of our own lives. For when men want to impress us with the effect of a new and wonderfully vivid light, do they not let it fall on the most familiar objects? that we may measure its intensity by remembering the former dimness? Then came the moment of the final blessing, when the forever sublime words, The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, seemed to blend with the calm afternoon sunshine that fell on the bowed heads of the congregation. And then the quiet rising, the mothers tying on the bonnets of the little maidens who had slept through the sermon, the fathers collecting the prayer books, until all streamed out through the old archway into the green churchyard, and began their neighborly talk, their simple civilities, and their invitations to tea. For on a Sunday every one was ready to receive a guest. It was the day when all must be in their best clothes and their best humor. Mr. and Mrs. Poyser paused a minute at the church gate. They were waiting for Adam to come up, not being contented to go away without saying a kind word to the widow and her sons. 
"'Well, Mrs. Bede,' said Mrs. Poyser, as they walked on together, "'you must keep up your heart. Husbands and wives must be content when they've lived to rear their children and see one another's hair grey.' "'Ay, ay,' said Mr. Poyser, "'they wanna have long to wait for one another then, anyhow. "'And you've got two of the strappinest sons o' the country. "'And well you may, for I remember poor Thias "'as fine a broad-shouldered fellow as need to be. "'And as for you, Mrs. Bede, "'why you're straighter o' the back nor half the young women now.' "'Eh,' said Lisbeth, "'it's poor luck for the platter to wear well "'when it's broke a two. "'The sooner I'm laid under the thorn the better. "'I'm no good to nobody now.' Adam never took notice of his mother's little unjust plaints, but Seth said, "'Nay, mother, thee mustna say so. Thy sons'll never get another mother.' "'That's true, lad, that's true,' said Mr. Poyser, "'and it's wrong on us to give way to grief, Mrs. Bede, for it's like the children crying when the fathers and mothers take things from em. There's one above knows better nor us.' "'Ah,' said Mrs. Poyser, "'and it's poor work always set in the dead above the livin'. It'd be better if folks had make much on us beforehand, instead of beginning when we're gone. It's but little good you'll do a water in the last year's crop. Well, Adam, said Mr. Poyser, feeling that his wife's words were, as usual, rather incisive than soothing, and that it would be well to change the subject, you'll come and see us again now, I hope. I hanna had a talk with you this long while, and the missus here wants you to see what can be done with her best spinning wheel, for it's got broke, and it'll be a nice job to mend it. They'll want a bit of turnin. You'll come as soon as you can now, will you? Mr. Poyser paused and looked around while he was speaking, as if to see where Hetty was, for the children were running on before. Hetty was not without a companion, and she had, besides, more pink and white about her than ever, for she held in her hand the wonderful pink and white hothouse plant, with a very long name, a Scotch name, she supposed, since people said Mr. Craig the gardener was Scotch. Adam took the opportunity of looking round, too, and I am sure you will not require of him that he should feel any vexation in observing a pouting expression on Hetty's face as she listened to the gardener's small talk. Yet in her secret heart she was glad to have him by her side, for she would perhaps learn from him how it was Arthur had not come to church. Not that she cared to ask him the question, but she hoped the information would be given spontaneously, for Mr. Craig, like a superior man, was very fond of giving information. Mr. Craig was never aware that his conversation and advances were received coldly, for to shift one's point of view beyond certain limits is impossible to the most liberal and expansive mind. We are none of us aware of the impression we produce on Brazilian monkeys of feeble understanding. It is possible they see hardly anything in us. Moreover, Mr. Craig was a man of sober passions, and was already in his tenth year of hesitation as to the relative advantages of matrimony and bachelorhood. It is true that now and then, when he had been a little heated by an extra glass of grog, he had been heard to say of Hetty that the lass was well enough, and that a man might do worse, but on convivial occasions men are apt to express themselves strongly. Martin Poyser held Mr. Craig in honour, as a man who knew his business, and who had great lights concerning soils and compost, but he was less of a favourite with Mrs. Poyser, who had more than once said in confidence to her husband, you're mighty fond o' Craig, but for my part I think he's welly like a cock as thinks the sun's rose a purpose to hear him crow. For the rest, Mr. Craig was an estimable gardener, and was not without reasons for having a high opinion of himself. He had also high shoulders and high cheekbones, and hung his head forward a little, as he walked along with his hands in his breeches pockets. I think it was his pedigree only that had the advantage of being Scotch, and not his bringing up, for except that he had a stronger burr in his accent, his speech differed little from that of the Loamshire people about him. But a gardener is Scotch, as a French teacher is Parisian. "'Well, Mr. Poyser,' he said, before the good slow farmer had time to speak, "'you'll not be carrying your hay to-morrow, I'm thinking. The glass sticks at change, and you may rely upon my word as will have more a downfall afore twenty-four hours is past. You see that darkish blue cloud there upon the horizon?' You know what I mean by the horizon, where the land and sky seems to meet. Ay, ay, I see the cloud, said Mr. Poyser, risin' or no risin'. It's right o'er my Coldsworth's fallow, and a foul fellow it is. Well, you mark my words, as that cloud'll spread o'er the sky pretty nigh as quick as you'd spread a tarpaulin over one o' your hayricks. It's a great thing to a study the look o' the clouds. Lord bless you. The meteorological almanacs can learn me nothing, but there's a pretty sight of things I could let them up to if they'd just come to me. And how are you, Mrs. Poyser? 
thinking o' gathering the red currants soon, I reckon. You'd a deal better gather em afore they're o'er ripe, with such weather as we've got to look forward to. How do you do, Mistress Bede? Mr. Craig continued, without a pause, nodding, by the way, to Adam and Seth. I hope you enjoyed them spinach and gooseberries as I sent Chester with the other day. If you want vegetables while you're in trouble, you know where to come to. It's well known I'm not giving other folks things away, for when I've supplied the house the garden is my own speculation, and it isn't every man the old squire could get as would be equal to the undertaking, let alone asking whether he'd be willing. I've got to run my calculation fine, I can tell you, to make sure o' getting back the money as I pay the squire. I should like to see some o' them fellows as make the almanacs looking as far before their noses as I've got to do every year as comes. They look pretty fur, though, said Mr. Poyser, turning his head on one side and speaking in rather a subdued reverential tone. Why, what could come truer nor that picture o' the cock with the big spurs, as has got its head knocked down with the anchor, and the firin and the ships behind? Why, that picture was made afore Christmas, and yet it's come as true as the Bible. Why, the cock's France, and the anchor's Nelson, and they told us that beforehand. Pee said Mr. Craig. A man doesn't want to see fur as to know the English'll beat the French. Why, I know upon good authority, as it's a big Frenchman as reaches five foot high, and they live upon spoon-meat mostly. I knew a man as his father had a particular knowledge of the French. I should like to know what them grasshoppers are to do against such fine fellows as our young Captain Arthur. Why, it did astonish a Frenchman only to look at him. His arm's thicker nor a Frenchman's body, I'll be bound, for they pinch their cells in with stays, and it's easy enough, for they got nothing on their insides. "'Where is the captain, as he wasn't at church to-day?' said Adam. "'I was talking to him a Friday, and he said nothing about his going away. "'Oh, he's only gone to Eagledale for a bit of fishing. "'I reckon he'll be back again afore many days are o'er, "'for he's to be at all the arranging and preparing of things "'for the coming age of the 30th of July. "'But he's fond of getting away for a bit now and then. "'Him and the old squire fit one another like frost and flowers.' "'Mr. Craig smiled and winked slowly as he made this last observation, but the subject was not developed farther, for now they had reached the turning in the road where Adam and his companions must say good-bye. The gardener, too, would have had to turn off in the same direction if he had not accepted Mr. Poyser's invitation to tea. Mrs. Poyser duly seconded the invitation, for she would have held it a deep disgrace not to make her neighbours welcome to her house. Personal likes and dislikes must not interfere with that sacred custom. Moreover, Mr. Craig had always been full of civilities to the family at the Hall Farm, and Mrs. Poyser was scrupulous in declaring that she had nothing to say again him, only it was a pity he couldn't be hatched o'er again and hatched different. So Adam and Seth, with their mother between them, wound their way down to the valley and up again to the old house, where a saddened memory had taken the place of a long, long anxiety, where Adam would never have to ask again as he entered, Where's father? and the other family party, with Mr. Craig for company, went back to the pleasant bright house-place at the Hall Farm, all with quiet minds except Hetty, who knew now where Arthur was gone, but was only the more puzzled and uneasy. For it appeared that his absence was quite voluntary. He need not have gone. He would not have gone if he had wanted to see her. She had a sickening sense that no lot could ever be pleasant to her again if her Thursday night's vision was not to be fulfilled and in this moment of chill, bare, wintry disappointment and doubt, she looked towards the possibility of being with Arthur again, of meeting his loving glance, and hearing his soft words with that eager yearning which one may call the growing pain of passion. End of chapter 18「『Adam Bede』This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. « Adam Bede » by George Eliot. Chapter 19. Adam on a Working Day. Notwithstanding Mr. Craig's prophecy, the dark blue cloud dispersed itself without having produced the threatened consequences. The weather, as he observed the next morning, the weather, you see, is a ticklish thing, and a fool'll hit on it sometimes when a wise man misses. That's why the almanacs get so much credit. It's one of them chancy things as fools thrive on. 
This unreasonable behavior of the weather, however, could displease no one else in Hayslope besides Mr. Craig. All hands were to be out in the meadows this morning, as soon as the dew had risen. The wives and daughters did double work in every farmhouse, that the maids might give their help in tossing the hay. And when Adam was marching along the lanes, with his basket of tools over his shoulder, he caught the sound of jocose talk and ringing laughter from behind the hedges. The jocose talk of haymakers is best at a distance. Like those clumsy bells round the cow's necks, it has a rather coarse sound when it comes close, and may even grate on your ears painfully. But heard from far off, it mingles very prettily with the other joyous sounds of nature. Men's muscles move better when their souls are making merry music, though their merriment is of a poor blundering sort, not at all like the merriment of birds. And perhaps there is no time in a summer's day more cheering than when the warmth of the sun is just beginning to triumph over the freshness of the morning, when there is just a lingering hint of early coolness to keep off languor under the delicious influence of warmth. The reason Adam was walking along the lanes at this time was because his work for the rest of the day lay at a country house about three miles off, which was being put in repair for the son of a neighboring squire, and he had been busy since early morning with the packing of panels, doors, and chimney pieces in a wagon, which was now gone on before him, while Jonathan Burge himself had ridden to the spot on horseback to await its arrival and direct the workmen. This little walk was a rest to Adam, and he was unconsciously under the charm of the moment. It was a summer morning in his heart, and he saw Hetty in the sunshine, a sunshine without glare, with slanting rays that tremble between the delicate shadows of the leaves. He thought, yesterday, when he put out his hand to her as they came out of church, that there was a touch of melancholy kindness in her face, such as he had not seen before, and he took it as a sign that she had some sympathy with his family trouble. Poor fellow! That touch of melancholy came from quite another source, but how was he to know? We look at the one little woman's face we love as we look at the face of our mother earth and see all sorts of answers to our own yearnings. It was impossible for Adam not to feel that what had happened in the last week had brought the prospect of marriage nearer to him. Hitherto he had felt keenly the danger that some other man might step in and get possession of Hetty's heart and hand, while he himself was still in a position that made him shrink from asking her to accept him. Even if he had had a strong hope that she was fond of him, and his hope was far from being strong, he had been too heavily burdened with other claims to provide a home for himself and Hetty, a home such as he could expect her to be content with, after the comfort and plenty of the farm. Like all strong natures, Adam had confidence in his ability to achieve something in the future. He felt sure he should some day, if he lived, be able to maintain a family and make a good broad path for himself but he had too cool a head not to estimate to the full the obstacles that were to be overcome. And the time would be so long. And there was Hetty, like a bright-cheeked apple hanging over the orchard wall, within sight of everybody, and everybody must long for her. To be sure, if she loved him very much, she would be content to wait for him. But did she love him? His hopes had never risen so high that he had dared to ask her. He was clear-sighted enough to be aware that her uncle and aunt would have looked kindly on his suit, and indeed without this encouragement he would never have persevered in going to the farm. But it was impossible to come to any but fluctuating conclusions about Hetty's feelings. She was like a kitten, and had the same distractingly pretty looks that meant nothing for everybody that came near her. But now he could not help saying to himself that the heaviest part of his burden was removed, and that even before the end of another year his circumstances might be brought into a shape that would allow him to think of marrying. It would always be a hard struggle with his mother, he knew. She would be jealous of any wife he might choose, and she had set her mind especially against Hetty, perhaps for no other reason than that she suspected Hetty to be the woman he had chosen. It would never do, he feared, for his mother to live in the same house with him when he was married. And yet how hard she would think it if he asked her to leave him. Yes, there was a great deal of pain to be gone through with his mother but it was a case in which he must make her feel that his will was strong. It would be better for her in the end. For himself he would have liked that they should all live together till Seth was married, and they might have built a bit themselves to the old house and made more room. He did not like to part with the lad. They had hardly ever been separated for more than a day since they were born. But Adam had no sooner caught his imagination leaping forward in this way, making arrangements for an uncertain future, than he checked himself. 
a pretty building I'm making without either bricks or timber. I'm up at the garret already, and I haven't so much as dug the foundation. Whenever Adam was strongly convinced of any proposition, it took the form of a principle in his mind. It was knowledge to be acted on, as much as the knowledge that damp will cause rust. Perhaps here lay the secret of the hardness he had accused himself of. He had too little fellow-feeling with the weakness that errs in spite of foreseen consequences. Without this fellow-feeling, how are we to get enough patience and charity towards our stumbling, falling companions in the long and changeful journey? And there is but one way in which a strong, determined soul can learn it, by getting his heart-strings bound round the weak and erring, so that he must share not only the outward consequence of their error, but their inward suffering. That is a long and hard lesson, and Adam had at present only learned the alphabet of it in his father's sudden death, which, by annihilating in an instant all that had stimulated his indignation, had sent a sudden rush of thought and memory over what had claimed his pity and tenderness. But it was Adam's strength, not its correlative hardness, that influenced his meditations this morning. He had long made up his mind that it would be wrong as well as foolish for him to marry a blooming young girl so long as he had no other prospect than that of growing poverty with a growing family. And his savings had been so constantly drawn upon, besides the terrible sweep of paying for Seth's substitute in the militia, that he had not enough money beforehand to furnish even a small cottage and keep something in reserve against a rainy day. He had good hope that he should be firmer on his legs by and by, but he could not be satisfied with a vague confidence in his arm and brain. He must have definite plans, and set about them at once. The partnership with Jonathan Burge was not to be thought of at present. There were things implicitly tacked to it that he could not accept. But Adam thought that he and Seth might carry on a little business for themselves, in addition to their journeyman's work, by buying a small stock of superior wood, and making articles of household furniture, for which Adam had no end of contrivances. Seth might gain more by working at separate jobs under Adam's direction than by his journeyman's work, and Adam, in his over-hours, could do all the nice work that required peculiar skill. The money gained in this way, with the good wages he received as foreman, would soon enable them to get beforehand with the world, so sparingly as they would all live now. No sooner had this little plan shaped itself in his mind than he began to be busy with exact calculations about the wood to be bought and the particular article of furniture that should be undertaken first, a kitchen cupboard of his own contrivance, with such an ingenious arrangement of sliding doors and bolts, such convenient nooks for stowing household provender, and such a symmetrical result to the eye, that every good housewife would be in raptures with it, and fall through all the gradations of melancholy longing till her husband promised to buy it for her. Adam pictured to himself Mrs. Poyser, examining it with her keen eye, and trying in vain to find out a deficiency. And, of course, close to Mrs. Poyser stood Hetty, and Adam was again beguiled from calculations and contrivances into dreams and hopes. Yes, he would go and see her this evening. It was so long since he had been at the hall farm. He would have liked to go to the night school, to see why Bartle Massey had not been at church yesterday, for he feared his old friend was ill, but unless he could manage both visits, this last must be put off till to-morrow. The desire to be near Hetty and to speak to her again was too strong. As he made up his mind to this, he was coming very near to the end of his walk, within the sound of the hammers at work on the refitting of the old house. The sound of tools to a clever workman who loves his work is like the tentative sounds of the orchestra to the violinist who has to bear his part in the overture. The strong fibers begin their accustomed thrill, and what was a moment before joy, vexation, or ambition begins its change into energy. All passion becomes strength when it has an outlet from the narrow limits of our personal lot, in the labor of our right arm, the cunning of our right hand, or the still creative activity of our thought. Look at Adam through the rest of the day as he stands on the scaffolding with the two-feet ruler in his hand, whistling low while he considers how a difficulty about a floor joist or a window frame is to be overcome, or as he pushes one of the younger workmen aside and takes his place in upheaving a weight of timber, saying, Let alone, lad, thee's got too much gristle o' thy bones yet, or as he fixes his keen black eyes on the motions of a workman on the other side of the room and warns him that his distances are not right. Look at this broad-shouldered man with the bare muscular arms and the thick, firm black hair, tossed about like trodden meadow-grass whenever he takes off his paper cap, 
and with the strong baritone voice bursting every now and then into loud and solemn psalm tunes, as if seeking an outlet for superfluous strength, yet presently checking himself, apparently crossed by some thought which jars with the singing. Perhaps, if you had not been already in the secret, you might not have guessed what sad memories, what warm affection, what tender, fluttering hopes had their home in this athletic body with the broken fingernails, in this rough man who knew no better lyrics than he could find in the old and new version and an occasional hymn, who knew the smallest possible amount of profane history, and for whom the motion and shape of the earth, the course of the sun, and the changes of the seasons lay in the region of mystery just made visible by fragmentary knowledge. It had cost Adam a great deal of trouble and his work in over-hours to know what he knew, over and above the secrets of his handicraft, and that acquaintance with mechanics and figures and the nature of the materials he worked with, which was made easy to him by inborn inherited faculty, to get the mastery of his pen and write a plain hand, to spell without any other mistakes than must in fairness be attributed to the unreasonable character of orthography rather than to any deficiency in the speller, and moreover to learn his musical notes and part singing. Besides all this, he had read his Bible, including the apocryphal books, Poor Richard's Almanac, Taylor's Holy Living and Dying, The Pilgrim's Progress with Bunyan's Life and Holy War, a great deal of Bailey's Dictionary, Valentine and Orson, and part of a history of Babylon, which Bartle Massey had lent him. He might have had many more books from Bartle Massey, but he had no time for reading The Common Print, as Lisbeth called it, so busy as he was with figures in all the leisure moments which he did not fill up with extra carpentry. Adam, you perceive, was by no means a marvellous man, nor, properly speaking, a genius. Yet I will not pretend that his was an ordinary character among workmen, and it would not be at all a safe conclusion that the next best man you may happen to see, with a basket of tools over his shoulder and a paper cap on his head, has the strong conscience and the strong sense, the blended susceptibility and self-command of our friend Adam. He was not an average man. Yet such men as he are reared here and there in every generation of our peasant artisans, with an inheritance of affections nurtured by a simple family life, of common need and common industry, and an inheritance of faculties trained in skillful, courageous labor. They make their way upwards, rarely as geniuses, most commonly as painstaking, honest men, with the skill and conscience to do well the tasks that lie before them. Their lives have no discernible echo beyond the neighborhood where they dwelt, but you are almost sure to find there some good piece of road, some building, some application of mineral produce, some improvement in farming practice, some reform of parish abuses, with which their names are associated by one or two generations after them. Their employers were the richer for them, the work of their hands has worn well, and the work of their brains has guided well the hands of other men. They went about in their youth in flannel or paper caps, in coats black with coal dust or streaked with lime and red paint. In old age their white hairs are seen in a place of honor at church and at market, and they tell their well-dressed sons and daughters, seated round the bright hearth on winter evenings, how pleased they were when they first earned their two pence a day. Others there are who die poor and never put off the workman's coal on weekdays. They have not had the art of getting rich, but they are men of trust, and when they die before the work is all out of them, it is as if some main screw had got loose in a machine. The master who employed them says, Where shall I find their like? End of chapter 19of Adam Bede. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Missy, Guangzhou, China. Adam Bede by George Eliot. Chapter 20. Adam Visits the Hall Farm. Adam came back from his work in the empty wagon. That was why he had changed his clothes, and was ready to set out to the hall farm when it still wanted a quarter to seven. "'What's thee got thy Sunday clues on for?' said Lisbeth complainingly, as he came downstairs. "'Thee art no going to the school i thy best coat.' "'No, mother,' said Adam quietly. "'I'm going to the hall farm, but mayhap I may go to the school after, so thee must no wonder if I'm a bit late. Seth'll be at home in half an hour. He's only gone to the village.' 
so they wouldna mind. Eh, and what's thee got thy best clothes on for to go to the hall farm? The poiser folks seed thee in them yesterday, I warrant. What dost mean by turnin' work a day into Sunday of Adam? It's poor keepin' company with folks as don't like to see thee in thy workin' jacket. Good-bye, mother, I can't stay, said Adam, putting on his hat and going out. But he had no sooner gone a few paces beyond the door than Lisbeth became uneasy at the thought that she had vexed him. Of course the secret of her objection to the best clothes was her suspicion that they were put on for Hetty's sake. But deeper than all her peevishness lay the need that her son should love her. She hurried after him and laid hold of his arm before he had got halfway down to the brook, and said, "'Nay, my lad, thee wouldn't go away angered with thy mother, and her got not to do but to sit by her sen and think on thee?' "'Nay, nay, mother,' said Adam gravely, and standing still while he put his arm on her shoulder, "'I'm not angered, but I wish for thy own sake thee'd be more contented to let me do what I've made up my mind to do. I'll never be no other than a good son to thee as long as we live. But a man has other feelings besides what he owes to his father and mother, and thee ought not to want to rule over me body and soul, and thee must make up thy mind as I'll not give way to thee where I've a right to do what I like. So let us have no more words about it. Eh, hey, said Lisbeth, not willing to show that she felt the real bearing of Adam's words, and who likes to see thee thy best clothes better nor thy mother? And when thee's got thy face washed, and clean as the smooth white pibble, and thy hair combed so nice, and thy eyes a sparkling, what else is there as thy old mother should like to look at half so well? And thee shan't put on thy Sunday clothes when thee likes for me, and I'll ne'er plague thee no more about him. Well, well. Good-bye, mother, said Adam, kissing her and hurrying away. He saw there was no other means of putting an end to the dialogue. Lisbeth stood still on the spot, shading her eyes and looking after him till he was quite out of sight. She felt to the full all the meaning that had lain in Adam's words, and as she lost sight of him and turned back slowly into the house, she said aloud to herself, for it was her way to speak her thoughts aloud in the long days when her husband and sons were at their work, "'Eh, hey, he'll be telling me as he's going to bring her home one of these days.' And she'll be missus or me, and I mun look on belike while she uses the blue-edged platters and breaks and mayhap, though there's ne'er been one broke sin my old man and me brought em at the county fair. Twenty year come next to us in tide. Hey, she went on still louder as she caught up her knitting from the table. But she'll ne'er knit the lad's stockings nor foot em neither, while I live, and when I'm gone he'll be thinking as nobody'll ne'er fit his leg and foot as his old mother did. She'll know nothing o' narrowing and healing, I'll warrant and she'll make a long toe as he canna get his boots on. That's what comes o' marrying young wenches. I were gone thirty and the feather too afore we were married, and young enough too. She'll be a poor dratchel by then she's thirty, a marrying o' that un, afore her teeth all come. Adam walked so fast that he was at the yard gate before seven. Martin Poyser and the grandfather were not yet come in from the meadow. Everyone was in the meadow, even to the black and tan terrier. No one kept watch in the yard but the bulldog and when Adam reached the house door, which stood wide open, he saw there was no one in the bright, clean house-place. But he guessed where Mrs. Poyser and some one else would be, quite within hearing, so he knocked on the door and said in his strong voice, "'Mrs. Poyser within! Come in, Mr. Bede, come in!' Mrs. Poyser called out from the dairy. She always gave Adam this title when she received him in her own house. "'You may come into the dairy, if you will, for I cannot justly leave the cheese.' Adam walked into the dairy, where Mrs. Poyser and Nancy were crushing the first evening cheese. "'Why, you might think you are come to a dead house,' said Mrs. Poyser, as he stood in the open doorway. "'They're all in the meadow, but Martin's sure to be in afore long, for they're leaving the haycock to-night, ready for carrying first thing to-morrow. I've been forced to have Nancy in, up account as Caddy must gather the red currants to-night. The fruit always ripens so contrary, just when every hand's wanted. "'and there's no trust in the children to gather it, "'for they put more into their own mouths nor into the basket. "'You might as well set the wasps to gather the fruit.' "'Adam longed to say he would go into the garden "'till Mr. Poyser came in, "'but he was not quite courageous enough. "'So he said, "'I could be looking at your spinning-wheel, then, "'and see what wants do into it. "'Perhaps it stands in the house where I can find it?' "'No, I've put it away in the right-hand parlour. "'But let it be till I can fetch it and show it to you.' I'd be glad now if you'd run into the garden and tell Hetty to send Totty in. The child'll run in if she's told, and I know Hetty's letting her eat too many currants. I'll be much obliged to you, Mr. Bede, if you'll go and send her in. And there's the York and Lancaster roses beautiful in the garden now. You'll like to see em. But you'd like a drink away first, perhaps. I know you're fond away, as most folks is when they hanna got to crush it out. Thank you, Mrs. Poyser, said Adam. 
A drink away is always a treat to me. I'd rather have it than beer any day. Ay, ay, said Mrs. Poyser, reaching a small white basin that stood on the shelf and dipping it into the whey tub. The smell o' bread's sweet to everybody but the baker. The misser wines all I say, Oh, Mrs. Poyser, I envy you your dairy, and I envy you your chickens, and what a beautiful thing a farmhouse is, to be sure. And I say, Yes, a farmhouse is a fine thing for them as look on, and don't know the lifting and the standing and the worritin' of the inside as belongs to it. "'Why, Mrs. Poyser, you wouldn't like to live anywhere else but in a farmhouse, so well as you manage it,' said Adam, taking the basin. "'And there can be nothing to look at pleasanter, nor a fine milk cow, standing up to its knees in pasture, and the new milk frothing in the pail, and the fresh butter ready for market, and the calves and the poultry. Here's to your health, and may you always have strength to look after your own dairy, and set a pattern to all the farmers' wives in the country.' Mrs. Poyser was not to be caught in the weakness of smiling at a compliment but a quiet complacency overspread her face like a stealing sunbeam, and gave a milder glance than usual to her blue-gray eyes, as she looked at Adam drinking the whey. Ah, I think I taste that whey now, with a flavor so delicate that one can hardly distinguish it from an odor, and with that soft, gliding warmth that fills one's imagination with a still, happy dreaminess. And the light music of the dropping whey is in my ears, mingling with the twittering of a bird outside the wire network window the window overlooking the garden, and shaded by tall gelder roses. "'Have a little more, Mr. Bede,' said Mrs. Poyser, as Adam set down the basin. "'No, thank you. I'll go into the garden now, and send in the little lass.' "'I do, and tell her to come to her mother in the dairy.' Adam walked round by the rickyard, at present empty of ricks, to the little wooden gate leading into the garden, once the well-tended kitchen garden of a manor-house. Now, but for the handsome brick wall with stone coping that ran along one side of it, a true farmhouse garden, with hardy perennial flowers, unpruned fruit trees, and kitchen vegetables growing together in careless half-neglected abundance. In that leafy, flowery, bushy time, to look for anyone in this garden was like playing at hide-and-seek. There were the tall hollyhocks beginning to flower and dazzle the eye, with their pink, white, and yellow. There were the syringias and gelder roses all large and disorderly for want of trimming. There were leafy walls of scarlet beans and late peas. There was a row of bushy filberts in one direction, and in another a huge apple tree making a barren circle under its low-spreading boughs. But what signified a barren patch or two? The garden was so large. There was always a superfluity of broad beans. It took nine or ten of Adam's strides to get to the end of the uncut grass walk that ran by the side of them. And as for other vegetables, there was so much more room than was necessary for them, that in the rotation of crops a large flourishing bed of groundsel was of yearly occurrence on one spot or other. The very rose-trees at which Adam stopped to pluck one looked as if they grew wild. They were all huddled together in bushy masses, now flaunting with wide-open petals, almost all of them of the streaked pink and white kind which doubtless dated from the union of the houses of York and Lancaster. Adam was wise enough to choose a compact province rose that peeped out, half smothered by its flaunting scentless neighbors, and held it in his hand. He thought he should be more at ease holding something in his hand, as he walked on to the far end of the garden, where he remembered there was the largest row of currant trees, not far off from the great yew tree arbor. But he had not gone many steps beyond the roses when he heard the shaking of a bough and a boy's voice saying, Now then, Totty, hold out your penny, there's a duck. The voice came from the boughs of a tall cherry tree, where Adam had no difficulty in discerning a small blue pinafored figure perched in a commodious position where the fruit was thickest. Doubtless Toddy was below, behind the screen of peas. Yes, with her bonnet hanging down her back and her fat face, dreadfully smeared with red juice, turned up towards the cherry tree while she held her little round hole of a mouth and her red-stained pinafore to receive the promised downfall. I am sorry to say more than half the cherries that fell were hard and yellow instead of juicy and red, but Toddy spent no time in useless regrets, and she was already sucking the third juiciest when Adam said, There now, Toddy, you've got your cherries. Run into the house with them to mother. She wants you. She's in the dairy. Run in this minute, there's a good little girl. He lifted her up in his strong arms and kissed her as he spoke, a ceremony which Toddy regarded as a tiresome interruption to cherry eating, and when he set her down she trotted off quite silently towards the house sucking her cherries as she went along. "'Tommy, my lad, take care you're not shot for a little thieving bird,' said Adam, as he walked on towards the currant trees. He could see there was a large basket at the end of the row. 
Hetty would not be far off, and Adam already felt as if she were looking at him. Yet when he turned the corner she was standing with her back towards him and stooping to gather the low-hanging fruit. Strange that she had not heard him coming. Perhaps it was because she was making the leaves rustle. She started when she became conscious that someone was near, started so violently that she dropped the basin with the currants in it, and then, when she saw it was Adam, she turned from pale to deep red. That blush made his heart beat with a new happiness. Hetty had never blushed at seeing him before. "'I frightened you,' he said, with a delicious sense that it didn't signify what he said, since Hetty seemed to feel as much as he did. "'Let me pick the currants up.' That was soon done, for they had only fallen in a tangled mass on the grass plot and Adam, as he rose and gave her the basin again, looked straight into her eyes with the subdued tenderness that belongs to the first moments of hopeful love. Hetty did not turn away her eyes. Her blush had subsided, and she met his glance with a quiet sadness, which contented Adam because it was so unlike anything he had seen in her before. "'There's not many more currants to get,' she said. "'I shall soon have done now.' "'I'll help you,' said Adam and he fetched a large basket, which was nearly full of currants, and set it close to them. Not a word more was spoken as they gathered the currants. Adam's heart was too full to speak, and he thought Hetty knew all that was in it. She was not indifferent to his presence after all. She had blushed when she saw him, and then there was that touch of sadness about her, which must surely mean love, since it was the opposite of her usual manner which had often impressed him as indifference and he could glance at her continually as she bent over the fruit, while the level evening sunbeams stole through the thick apple-tree boughs, and rested on her round cheek and neck as if they too were in love with her. It was, to Adam, the time that a man can least forget in after-life, the time when he believes that the first woman he has ever loved betrays, by a slight something, a word, a tone, a glance, the quivering of a lip or an eyelid, that she is at least beginning to love him in return. The sign is so slight it is scarcely perceptible to the ear or eye. He could describe it to no one. It is a mere feather touch, yet it seems to have changed his whole being, to have merged an uneasy yearning into a delicious unconsciousness of everything but the present moment. So much of our early gladness vanishes utterly from our memory. We can never recall the joy with which we laid our heads on our mother's bosom, or rode on our father's back in childhood. Doubtless that joy is wrought up into our nature, as the sunlight of long past mornings is wrought up in the soft mellowness of the apricot. But it is gone forever from our imagination, and we can only believe in the joy of childhood. But the first glad moment in our first love is a vision which returns to us to the last, and brings with it a thrill of feeling intense and special as the recurrent sensation of a sweet odor breathed in a far-off hour of happiness. It is a memory that gives a more exquisite touch to tenderness, that feeds the madness of jealousy and adds the last keenness to the agony of despair. Hetty bending over the red bunches, the level rays piercing the screen of apple-tree boughs, the length of bushy garden beyond, his own emotion as he looked at her and believed that she was thinking of him, and that there was no need for them to talk. Adam remembered it all to the last moment of his life. And Hetty... You know quite well that Adam was mistaken about her. Like many other men, he thought the signs of love for another were signs of love towards himself. When Adam was approaching unseen by her, she was absorbed, as usual, in thinking and wondering about Arthur's possible return. The sound of any man's footstep would have affected her just in the same way. She would have felt it might be Arthur before she had time to see and the blood that forsook her cheek in the agitation of that momentary feeling would have rushed back again at the sight of any one else, just as much as at the sight of Adam. He was not wrong in thinking that a change had come over Hetty. The anxieties and fears of a first passion, with which she was trembling, had become stronger than vanity, had given her for the first time that sense of helpless dependence on another's feeling, which awakens the clinging, deprecating womanhood even in the shallowest girl that can ever experience it and creates in her a sensibility to kindness which found her quite hard before. For the first time Hetty felt that there was something soothing to her in Adam's timid yet manly tenderness. She wanted to be treated lovingly. Oh, it was very hard to bear this blank of absence, silence, apparent indifference, after those moments of glowing love. 
She was not afraid that Adam would tease her with love-making and flattering speeches, like her other admirers. He had always been so reserved to her. She could enjoy without any fear the sense that this strong, brave man loved her, and was near her. It never entered into her mind that Adam was pitiable, too, that Adam, too, must suffer one day. Hetty, we know, was not the first woman that had behaved more gently to the man who loved her in vain, because she had herself begun to love another. It was a very old story, but Adam knew nothing about it, so he drank in the sweet delusion. "'That'll do,' said Hetty, after a little while. "'Aunt wants me to leave some on the trees. I'll take them in now.' "'It's very well I came to carry the basket,' said Adam, "'for it'd have been too heavy for your little arms.' "'No, I could have carried it with both hands.' "'Oh, I dare say,' said Adam, smiling, "'and been as long getting into the house as a little ant carrying a caterpillar. "'Have you ever seen those tiny fellows carrying things four times as big as themselves?' "'No,' said Hetty, indifferently, "'not caring to know the difficulties of ant life. "'Oh, I used to watch em often when I was a lad. "'But now, you see, I can carry the basket with one arm, "'as if it was an empty nutshell, and give you the other arm to lean on.' "'Won't you? Such big arms as mine were made for little arms like yours to lean on.' Hetty smiled faintly and put her arm within his. Adam looked down at her, but her eyes were turned dreamily towards another corner of the garden. "'Have you ever been to Eagledale?' she said, as they walked slowly along. "'Yes,' said Adam, pleased to have her ask a question about himself. Ten years ago, when I was a lad, I went with father to see about some work there. It's a wonderful sight, rocks and caves such as you never saw in your life. I never had a right notion o' rocks till I went there. How long did it take to get there? Why, it took us the best part o' two days walking. But it's nothing of a day's journey for anybody as has got a first-rate nag. The captain would get there in nine or ten hours, I'll be bound. He's such a rider. And I shouldn't wonder if he's back again to-morrow. He's too active to rest long in that lonely place, all by himself for there's nothing but a bit of a inn i that part where he's gone to fish. I wish he'd got the estate in his hands. That'd be the right thing for him, for it'd give him plenty to do, and he'd do it well, too, for all he's so young. He's got better notions o' things than many a man twice his age. He spoke very handsome to me the other day about lending me money to set up a business, and if things came round that way, I'd rather be beholden to him nor to any man in the world." Poor Adam was led on to speak about Arthur, because he thought Hetty would be pleased to know that the young squire was so ready to befriend him. The fact entered into his future prospects, which he would like to seem promising in her eyes. And it was true that Hetty listened with an interest which brought a new light into her eyes and a half-smile upon her lips. "'How pretty the roses are now,' Adam continued, pausing to look at them. "'See, I stole the prettiest, but I didn't mean to keep it myself. I think these as are all pink and have got a finer sort of green leaves are prettier than the striped ones, don't you? He set down the basket and took the rose from his buttonhole. It smells very sweet, he said. Those striped ones have no smell. Stick it in your frock, and then you can put it in water after. It'd be a pity to let it fade. Hetty took the rose, smiling as she did so, at the pleasant thought that Arthur could so soon get back if he liked. There was a flash of hope and happiness in her mind and with a sudden impulse of gaiety she did what she had very often done before, stuck the rose in her hair, a little above the left ear. The tender admiration in Adam's face was slightly shadowed by reluctant disapproval. Hetty's love of finery was just the thing that would most provoke his mother, and he himself disliked it as much as it was possible for him to dislike anything that belonged to her. Ah, he said, that's like the ladies in the pictures at the chase. They've mostly got flowers or feathers or gold things in their hair. But somehow I don't like to see em. They always put me in mind o' the painted women outside the shows at Treadleson Fair. What can a woman have to set her off better than her own hair, when it curls so like yours? If a woman's young and pretty, I think you can see her good looks all the better for her being plain-dressed. Why, Dinah Morris looks very nice, for all she wears such a plain cap and gown. It seems to me as a woman's face doesn't want flowers. It's almost like a flower itself. I'm sure yours is. Oh, very well, said Hetty, with a little playful pout, taking the rose out of her hair. I'll put one of Dinah's caps on when we go in, and you'll see if I look better in it. She left one behind, so I can take the pattern. Nay, nay, I don't want you to wear a Methodist cap like Dinah's. 
I dare say it's a very ugly cap, and I used to think when I saw her here as it was nonsense for her to dress different to other people. But I never rightly noticed her till she came to see mother last week, and then I thought the cap seemed to fit her face somehow, as the acorn cup fits the acorn, and I shouldn't like to see her so well without it. But you've got another sort of face. I'd have you look just as you are now, without anything to interfere with your own looks. It's like when a man's singing a good tune. You don't want to hear bells tinkling and interfering with the sound. He took her arm and put it within his again, looking down on her fondly. He was afraid she should think he had lectured her, imagining, as we are apt to do, that she had perceived all the thoughts he had only half expressed. And the thing he dreaded most was lest any cloud should come over this evening's happiness. For the world he would not have spoken of his love to Hetty yet, till this commencing kindness towards him should have grown into unmistakable love. In his imagination he saw long years of his future life stretching before him, blessed with the right to call Hetty his own. He could be content with very little at present. So he took up the basket of currants once more, and they went on towards the house. The scene had quite changed in the half-hour that Adam had been in the garden. The yard was full of life now. Marty was letting the screaming geese through the gate, and wickedly provoking the gander by hissing at him. The granary door was groaning on its hinges as Alec shut it, after dealing out the corn. The horses were being led out to watering, amidst much barking of all the three dogs and many whoops from Tim the plowman, as if the heavy animals who held down their meek, intelligent heads and lifted their shaggy feet so deliberately were likely to rush wildly in every direction but the right. Every one was come back from the meadow, and when Hetty and Adam entered the house-place Mr. Poyser was seated in the three-cornered chair, and the grandfather in the large armchair opposite, looking on with pleasant expectation while the supper was being laid on the oak table. Mrs. Poyser had laid the cloth herself, a cloth made of homespun linen, with a shining checkered pattern on it, and of an agreeable whitey-brown hue, such as all sensible housewives like to see none of your bleached shop rag that would wear into holes in no time but good homespun that would last for two generations the cold veal the fresh lettuces and the stuffed chine might well look tempting to hungry men who had dined at half-past twelve o'clock on the large deal table against the wall there were bright pewter plates and spoons and cans ready for alec and his companions for the master and servants ate their supper not far off each other which was all the pleasanter because if a remark about to-morrow morning's work occurred to Mr. Poyser, Alec was at hand to hear it. "'Well, Adam, I'm glad to see ye,' said Mr. Poyser. "'What, ye've been helping Hetty to gather the currants, eh? Come, sit ye down, sit ye down. Why, it's pretty near a three weeks since ye had your supper with us, and the missus has got one of her rare stuffed chines. I'm glad ye're come.' "'Hetty,' said Mrs. Poyser, as she looked into the basket of currants to see if the fruit was fine, Run upstairs and send Molly down. She's putting Totty to bed, and I want her to draw the ale, for Nancy's busy yet at the dairy. You can see to the child. But whatever did you let her run away from you along with Tommy for, and stuff herself with fruit as she can't eat a bit of good victual? This was said in a lower tone than usual, while her husband was talking to Adam, for Mrs. Poyser was strict in adherence to her own rules of propriety, and she considered that a young girl was not to be treated sharply in the presence of a respectable man who was courting her. That would not be fair play. Every woman was young in her turn, and had her chances of matrimony, which it was a point of honour for other women not to spoil, just as one market woman who has sold her own eggs must not try to bulk another of a customer. Hetty made haste to run away upstairs, not easily finding an answer to her aunt's question, and Mrs. Poyser went out to see after Marty and Tommy and bring them into supper. Soon they were all seated, the two rosy lads, one on each side, by the pale mother, a place being left for Hetty between Adam and her uncle. Alec, too, was come in, and was seated in his far corner, eating cold broad beans out of a large dish with his pocket-knife, and finding a flavour in them which he would not have exchanged for the finest pineapple. "'What a time that girl is drawing the ale, to be sure,' said Mrs. Poyser, when she was dispensing her slices of stuffed chine. "'I think she sets the jug under and forgets to turn the tap, as there's nothing you can't believe of them wenches.' they'll set the empty kettle o' the fire and then come an hour after to see if the water boils she's drawn for the men too said mr poyser thee shouldst had told her to bring our jug up first told her said mrs poyser yes i might spend all the wind in my body and take the bellows too if i was to tell them girls everything as their own sharpness want to tell em mr bede will you take some vinegar with your lettuce ay you're in the right knot 
It spoils the flavour of the chine, to my thinking. It's poor eatin' where the flavour of the meat lies o' the cruets. There's folks as make bad butter and trustin' to the salt to hide it. Mrs. Poyser's attention was here diverted by the appearance of Molly, carrying a large jug, two small mugs, and four drinking cans, all full of ale or small beer, an interesting example of the prehensile power possessed by the human hand. Poor Molly's mouth was rather wider open than usual as she walked along with her eyes fixed on the double cluster of vessels in her hands, quite innocent of the expression in her mistress's eye. "'Molly, I never knew your equals. To think o' your poor mother as is a widow, and I took you with as good as no character, and the times and times I've told you.' Molly had not seen the lightning, and the thunder shook her nerves the more for the want of that preparation. With a vague, alarmed sense that she must somehow comport herself differently, she hastened her step a little towards the far deal table, where she might set down her cans, caught her foot in her apron, which had become untied, and fell with a crash and a splash into a pool of beer, whereupon a tittering explosion from Marty and Tommy, and a serious, "'Ello!" from Mr. Poyser, who saw his draught of owl unpleasantly deferred. "'There you go,' resumed Mrs. Poyser, in a cutting tone, as she rose and went towards the cupboard, while Molly began dolefully to pick up the fragments of pottery. "'It's what I told you had come over and over again, and there's your month's wage gone and more to pay for that jug, as I've had of the house this ten year, and nothing ever happened to it before, but the crockery you've broke sin here in the house you've been would make a parson swear. God forgive me for saying so, and if it had been a boiling wart out of the copper it had been the same, and you'd have been scalded and very like lame for life, as there's no knowing but what you will be some day if you go on, for anybody would think you'd got the St. Vitus's dance to see the things you've throwed down. It's a pity but what the bits was stacked up for you to see, though it's neither seeing nor hearing as'll make much odds to you. Anybody would think you were case hardened. Poor Molly's tears were dropping fast by this time, and in her desperation at the lively movement of the beer stream towards Alec's legs, she was converting her apron into a mop, while Mrs. Poyser, opening the cupboard, turned a blighting eye upon her. Ah, she went on, you'll do no good with crying and making more wet to wipe up. It's all your own wilfulness, as I tell you, for there's nobody no call to break anything if they'll only go the right way to work. But wooden folks had need to have wooden things to handle, and here must I take the brown and white jug, as it's never been used three times this year, and go down in the cellar myself, and belike catch my death, and be laid up with inflammation. Mrs. Poyser had turned round from the cupboard with the brown and white jug in her hand, when she caught sight of something at the other end of the kitchen. Perhaps it was because she was already trembling and nervous that the apparition had so strong an effect on her. Perhaps jug-breaking, like other crimes, has a contagious influence. However it was, she stared and started like a ghost-seer, and the precious brown and white jug fell to the ground, parting forever with its spout and handle. "'Did ever anybody see the like?' she said, with a suddenly lowered tone, after a moment's bewildered glance round the room. "'The jugs are bewitched, I think. It's them nasty glazed handles. They slip o'er the finger like a snail.' "'Why, these let thy own whip fly o' thy face,' said her husband, who had now joined in the laugh of the young ones. "'It's all very fine to look on and grin,' rejoined Mrs. Poyser, "'but there's times when the crockery seems alive "'and flies out of your hand like a bird. "'It's like the glass sometimes will crack as it stands. "'What is to be broke will be broke, "'for I never dropped a thing in my life for want of holding it, "'else I never should have kept the crockery all these years "'as I bought at my own wedding. "'And, Hetty, are you mad? "'Whatever do you mean by coming down in that way "'and making one think as there's a ghost walking in the house?' A new outbreak of laughter, while Mrs. Poyser was speaking, was caused, less by her sudden conversion to a fatalistic view of jug-breaking, than by that strange appearance of Hetty, which had startled her aunt. The little minx had found a black gown of her aunt's, and pinned it as close round her neck to look like Dinah's, had made her hair as flat as she could, and had tied on one of Dinah's high-crowned borderless neck caps. The thought of Dinah's pale grey face and mild grey eyes, which the sight of the gown and cap brought with it, made it a laughable surprise enough to see them replaced by Hetty's round, rosy cheeks and coquettish dark eyes. The boys got off their chairs and jumped round her, clapping their hands, and even Alec gave a low, ventral laugh as he looked up from his beams. Under cover of the noise Mrs. Poyser went into the back kitchen to send Nancy into the cellar, with the great pewter measure, which had some chance of being free from bewitchment. "'Why, Hetty, lass, are ye turned Methodist?' said Mr. Poyser with that comfortable, slow enjoyment of a laugh which one only sees in stout people. "'You must pull your face a deal longer before you'll do for one, mustn't she, Adam? 
How come you put them things on, eh? Adam said he liked Dinah's cap and gown better nor my clothes, said Hetty, sitting down demurely. He says folks looks better in ugly clothes. Nay, nay, said Adam, looking at her admiringly. I only said they seemed to suit Dinah. But if I'd said you'd look pretty in em, I should have said nothing but what was true. Why, thee thoughtest Teddy were a ghost, didn't thou? said Mr. Poyser, to his wife, who now came back and took her seat again. Thee looks as scared as scared. It little signifies how I looked, said Mrs. Poyser. Looks o' men no jugs, nor laughin neither, as I see. Mr. Bede, I'm sorry you've to wait so long for your ale, but it's comin' in a minute. Make yourself at home with the cold potatoes. I know you like em. Tommy, I'll send you to bed this minute if you don't give over laughin. What is there to laugh at, I should like to know? I'd sooner cry nor laugh at the sight of that poor thing's cap. And there's them as it'd be better if they could make theirselves like her in more ways nor put in on her cap. It little becomes anybody of this house to make fun of my sister's child, and her just gone away from us, as it went to my heart to part with her. And I know one thing, as if trouble was to come, and I was to be laid up in my bed, and the children was to die, as there's no knowing but what they will, and the murrain was to come among the cattle again, and everything went to rack and ruin, I say we might be glad to get sight of Dinah's cap again, with her own face under it, border or no border, for she's one of them things as looks the brightest on a rainy day, and loves you the best when you're most in need of it. Mrs. Poyser, you perceive, was aware that nothing would be so likely to expel the comic as the terrible. Tommy, who was of a susceptible disposition, and very fond of his mother, and who had, besides, eaten so many cherries as to have his feelings less under command than usual, was so affected by the dreadful picture she had made of the possible future that he began to cry. And the good-natured father, indulgent to all weaknesses but those of negligent farmers, said to Hetty, "'You'd better take the things off again, my lass. It hurts your aunt to see em. Hetty went upstairs again, and the arrival of the ale made an agreeable diversion. For Adam had to give his opinion of the new tap, which could not be otherwise than complimentary to Mrs. Poyser, and then followed a discussion on the secrets of good brewing, the folly of stinginess in hopping, and the doubtful economy of a farmer's making his own malt. Mrs. Poyser had so many opportunities of expressing herself with weight on these subjects, that by the time supper was ended, the ale jug refilled, and Mr. Poyser's pipe alight, she was once more in high good humour, and ready, at Adam's request, to fetch the broken spinning-wheel for his inspection. "'Ah!' said Adam, looking at it carefully. "'Here's a nice bit of turnin' wanted. It's a pretty wheel. I must have it up at the turnin' shop in the village and do it there, for I've no convenience for turnin' at home. If you'll send it to Mr. Burge's shop of the morning, I'll get it done for you by Wednesday. I've been turnin' it over in my mind,' he continued, looking at Mr. Poyser, "'to make a bit more convenience at home for nice jobs of cabinet making. I've always done a deal at such little things in odd hours, and they're profitable, for there's more workmanship nor material in em. I look for me and Seth to get a little business for ourselves in that way, for I know a man at Rossiter as'll take as many things as we should make, besides what we could get orders for round about. Mr. Poyser entered with interest into a project which seemed a step towards Adam becoming a master man, and Mrs. Poyser gave her approbation to the scheme of the movable kitchen cupboard, which was to be capable of containing grocery, pickles, crockery, and house linen in the utmost compactness without confusion. Hetty, once more in her own dress, with her neckerchief pushed a little backwards on this warm evening, was seated picking currants near the window, where Adam could see her quite well. And so the time passed pleasantly till Adam got up to go. He was pressed to come again soon, but not to stay longer, for at this busy time sensible people would not run the risk of being sleepy at five o'clock in the morning. "'I shall take a step farther,' said Adam, "'and go on to see Mr. Massey, for he wasn't at church yesterday, and I've not seen him for a week past. I've never hardly known him to miss church before. Ay, said Mr. Poyser, we've heard nothing about him, for it's the boys' holidays now, so we can give you no account.' "'But you'll never think of going there at this hour of the night,' said Mrs. Poyser, folding up her knitting. "'Oh, Mr. Massey sits up late,' said Adam, "'and the night school's not over yet. Some of the men don't come till late. They've got so far to walk, and Bartle himself's never in bed till it's gone eleven. "'I wouldn't a have him to live with me, then,' said Mrs. Poyser, "'a drop in candle-grease about, as you're like to tumble down to the floor the first thing in the morning. "'Ay, eleven o'clock's late. It's late,' said old Martin. "'I ne'er sat up so in my life. Not to say as it weren't a morrin, or a christenin, or a wake, or the harvest supper. Eleven o'clock's late. "'Why, I sit up till after twelve often,' said Adam, laughing. "'But it isn't to eat and drink extra, it's to work extra. Good night, Mrs. Poyser. Good night, Hetty.' 
Hetty could only smile and not shake hands, for hers were dyed and damp with currant juice, but all the rest gave a hearty shake to the large palm that was held out to them, and said, "'Come again, come again!' "'Ay, think of that now,' said Mr. Poyser, when Adam was out on the causeway. "'Sitting up till past twelve to do extra work. You'll not find many men as six-and-twenty as'll do to put o' the shafts with him. If you can catch Adam for a husband, Hetty, you'll ride in your own spring-cart some day, I'll be your warrant.' Hetty was moving across the kitchen with the currants, so her uncle did not see the little toss of the head with which she answered him. To ride in a spring cart seemed a very miserable lot indeed to her now. End of chapter 20